What was your feeling when you read the script for Joker for the first time? I was just very excited when I read it. It, it was incredibly powerful, even on the page, much like I think the final product. I was, it was, it, you know, scripts can go in many ways when you read them, particularly when you're reading, you know, I used to read scripts for a living. Like that's when I first moved to Los Angeles, uh, my first job was as a script reader. So you would spend, you know, weeks and weeks reading dozens and hundreds of scripts. And so you, you know, screenplays aren't necessarily always a correlation to the movie that they'll become. Like there are amazing screenplays that are really hard to translate on film. And then there are, you know, screenplays that are kind of whatever that can translate quite vividly. And they're, they're, the medium is sort of not necessarily correlates one to one. This screenplay, and I've read obviously all of Todd's stuff, it was, a, it was just a beautiful page turner in which every single scene and every section of, this, of the story felt super vivid. And I could see instantly how we could translate this to screen in a successful way. Like it wasn't one of those ones I just ex as used in ex as an example of where the correlation wasn't necessarily gonna be one to one. It was, you know, it was, it was exciting to see something that was such a deep dive into one human being's descent into madness or perhaps his ascent into his truest crazy self, you know, chaotic self, darkest self, um, his rebirth of sorts. So it was, it was a complex screenplay and something I was super excited to shoot for sure. In terms of the characters, you know, transformation, did any of the scenes um, concern you or did you feel that actually you could go darker, that maybe they weren't enough to really ramp up the emotion behind what his life was like? It's so funny because it was so long ago, you know, two years or so ago when I first read the screenplay and over the course of making a movie, you dissect it so, so much. Like you, everything becomes, first you're like breaking it down and figuring out how, what, how you're going to schedule the movie and shoot it in its parts and all these things that my first read of the screenplay versus like its final product, they're all now one thing. So it's an interesting question. Perhaps it would, it, I would almost need more time to sort of go back into my memory and think like, was there something I was scared about? Or was there something, um, certainly, you know, the, the couple very specific violent acts in the movie, I think you recognize, okay, the movie is gonna have these very specific, not a lot of them, there's just like a couple specific points of violence. And, you know, the killing of Murray Franklin which is at the end of the movie, spoiler. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where people are. I, I assume most, a lot of people have already seen the movie sure. if they're watching this, but um, you recognize, okay, that, that's a powerful thing that, that this character is doing. And how can we align ourselves with Arthur Fleck emotionally, feel the humanity of him and, and empathize with him as a human being and yet still not rationalize his acts in sure. the movie. And I think that was something that I certainly was aware of, certainly for me, that um, I felt like, okay, I think one of our objectives in this movie is to tell the story of a human being and how a human being can take a certain path and not necessarily you know, absolve those acts, but recognize and understand you know, the, the causation of them and and, the, and and that might be part of this, the telling of this story, so. You had a great feeling about the script. Did you think it was going to have the impact that it's had now? Whether positive, negative, box office results? Box office results, I thought it would be successful. You know, probably, you know, in enough like of a range in worldwide, maybe $300 million, that for the budget that we made it on, which was just under $60 million, that everyone would be okay. Like it wouldn't, it would be considered a hit. Everyone would be fine. You know, Warner Brothers would feel good about it. I thought it would be successful in that range, but the fact that it's become, you know, made a billion dollars, it broke the R-rated box office record. No, there's no way to predict that. Um, I certainly was aware from the beginning that this was going to have more eyes on it. Like more people were going to be interested in this movie than perhaps anything Todd and I had made before, because the Joker lore, the DC 
universe of that, everything about that character, partly because of Heath Ledger, Jack Nicholson, Jared Leto, all these sort of versions of Joker, I recognize that the certain, the fervent fan base was gonna have a lot of interest. And even the non fervent fan base, which I would include myself in that, somebody who you know, liked the Dark Knight series or the, the Nolan series, but not necessarily somebody who like watches all the comic book movies, uh, would be interested in as well. So we went, okay, we know that the stakes are high and it's not something where it can just exist in this sort of niche little place and you know, film fans will, will find it, but we don't have to worry about the, the mass audience. We recognize that, yeah, this movie is gonna, it's, a, it's, it's like if it falls flat, if it doesn't work, it's, it's also gonna have a big impact, you know, in the sense of it's not gonna be something that, that, that uh, is gonna go unseen or unnoticed. So that was, we were aware of that for sure. Were you the only cinematographer being considered for the job? That only Todd can answer. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, exactly. I've, uh, I mean, I've done the last six movies. This was our sixth film in 10, 11 years now. I, I mean, he brought the script to me quite early, but only Todd can answer. Okay. Like, was he, you know, and listen, the filmmaker, the director and DP relationship is such a, 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 a tight one. It's such an important one. We work so closely together. We argue sometimes. There's so many things that go into that relationship. Even myself having directed, I recognize how important that relationship is. And I never take for granted the fact that I'm gonna get another job with Todd simply because I got the last four or five. I just always treat it like it's a new slate. It's a new movie. He has the complete prerogative and right to wanna switch things up choose somebody else, all of those things. Of course, I love working with them and I would do it forever, but it's, uh, I also recognize that, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 and it's like an at will thing in which I'm grateful every time I have the opportunity to do a movie with him, but I, I don't know. I'm, I listen, there are a lot of really good DPs and I know Todd's fans of, of many of their work. We talk about the other DPs work. So yeah, I mean, that's Todd, I guess. <laughs> When did you and Todd Phillips first discuss Joker? Did he call you and say, I have this script? Yeah, he, he, he called me basically. I, he talked to me a little bit about the idea. Like, I think, I think I figured out this idea of like how we can make something that could be really cool, this character study, but we basically take a character from the, you know, from DC Universe and make something that just feels wholly unique. Like not, sorry, not a comic book movie, really just like an old, what could have been made in the 70s, but it just happens to be, you know, you know a movie that's about somebody who, who, who ultimately is part of that universe. And I thought that was amazing. And that was before I read the script. That was probably, I don't know, you know, six months before I read the script or something like that. And then finally, once he sort of really worked it out with Scott and got to a place where it was like a draft in which he wanted to show me, that's when I first read it. But I had known about the idea for some months before that. Where were you when you got the call? I was actually working on Godzilla, King of the Monsters, in Atlanta, and I was on my porch when Todd, I, it wasn't the call to say, hey, it was more of like, I sent you the script, have you read it yet? Let's talk about it. And so I had already read the script and then Oh, actually, no, maybe, maybe I'm having it wrong. Maybe it was just a call that I was sitting on my porch and he said, I've got the script, I'll send it to you soon, but I'd like you to shoot it. Uh, do you want to shoot it? And so it was that. And I just was sitting on the porch with my wife and, and uh, our, our daughter, I think at the time, who's like just been born um, in Atlanta. And, and, and I was like, yeah, man, I want to shoot this. So I think it was before I even read the script for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you talk about in your first meeting with a director, especially a director that you know so well, that you've done many films with? How is that conversation different or the same as maybe other conversations with other directors when you first start a project? Yeah, it's interesting with Todd and I, our conversations were never like long-winded, five, six-hour meetings, conversations. They're often like little conversations or even sometimes just like one or two ideas thrown out over months and months and months. So they're never like really, sometimes we'll do an actual page turn 
and we'll do it in small blocks where we actually turn through the page and take notes on sort of just ideas of like how we think we should shoot this. Are there any specific shots, any special pieces of equipment? Is this a scene that's handheld? Is it a scene that's long lens? Is it a scene that has a lot of camera movement? It's more of just what's the emotion of the scene and how do we translate that on screen? And so we'll do that probably later in prep once I'm you know, officially on the job and we have some time to break off. And we'll do that you know, as successfully as we can to get all the way through the script. Sometimes we don't get all the way through the script. Sometimes we just get through 30 or 40 pages, but it starts to inform the bigger picture of what the, the movie's gonna be. Early conversations are really pretty short, you know? It's like, I think our first conversation on Joker was literally about aspect ratio, you know, about what format, like what aspect ratio we'd shoot it in. And we both wanted to shoot it in 185, which was great because we were in agreement. So that was pretty straightforward. It was like, feels 185. And I was like, yeah, feels 185. End of that conversation. And then it was like, we're definitely gonna shoot film. Maybe we shoot large format, like 70 millimeter film. You know, we, we've loved those films. It felt like there was something about this movie. In, 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 you know, in, it's not Lawrence of Arabia in that sort of 70 millimeter way, but more like perhaps the master in the way that P.T. Anderson shot large format there in that it's a real character study. That was a bit of a two-hander between, uh, you know, Joaquin and, uh, and uh, what's his name? Uh, great actor, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, right? But nonetheless, it was an intimate story, but really a deep dive into the character and the minds of these human beings. And we thought, oh, that would be an interesting way to isolate this character in his environment, but allow us to sort of have this almost like true three-dimensional quality where we could really draw the audience into them by shooting large format. So we had that discussion early. And, and then we just talked about how just the vibe of it should feel handmade. Like it doesn't want to feel, even though it's a studio movie, and it just wants to feel very sort of constructed by human beings and that it doesn't want to feel too polished and too clean and all these things. And, and, and then we would start to say things like, well, you know, it's a character study in all those great 70s movies, which really were the decade in which you would see those character studies every weekend being released in the theaters, you know, whether it was, you know, obviously Taxi Driver or something like that, or King of Comedy. Of course, those have some correlation, but also Serpico or Dog Day Afternoon or Straight Time or any of these movies that just felt singularly about somebody, Midnight Cowboy. And, and those vibes, not necessarily the look and feel of the movies per se, because we weren't really referencing them. Sometimes we'd reference them and think, oh, that's, that's gonna show us something about how the movie should look. And mostly we would come away from like looking at a scene or something out of those movies and go, it's not, it's not really the look of the movie. Like we would hope maybe, oh, we could look at that, that would be the template, and we could just copy that template as to like color or contrast or, or the look and feel. And it was always like, it's not really the movie. So a lot of it was the discovery of like what the movie isn't to then figure out like what the movie wants to be. But certainly tone wise and the fact that those movies really were made by filmmakers that felt unencumbered by the studios and they were out there just making these movies in an independent way, even though they were released by big studios. That's I think the vibe of what we talked about. And so those were the early conversations. And then, you know, you're having conversations every day when you location scout, right? Every time you see a location, even if it's not the right one, you discover things about the scene. You know, you have discussions about, oh, why is this not the right one? Oh, because I want him to be able to travel from here to here. And so you're discovering things all the time when you're in prep, mostly in location scouts, even though location scouts are arduous. And I remember Soderbergh, when he claimed he was going to retire, even though he like said, I'm retired, and then made five movies that year or something. <laughs> uh, anyway, he, I think, had a quote or something where he's like, I just don't want to ever be spend another day in a scout van because they're just tiresome, right? They have to be in this van, traveling around, going in and out of like apartments and locations, and just, they can be tiring, and I understand why filmmakers hate them. But what's interesting about them is how informative they are to the look and feel of the movie because you've got the production designer, you've got me, you've got Todd, you've got the producer. So every day you're basically 
having those discussions in ways that are sometimes, you know, a sentence here, a sentence there. So that's the real prep of a movie as opposed to like what you would imagine are these like, you know, long eight hour days of like sitting and talking about cerebrally about what the movie should be. It's not really that at all. And also building that world, the feel of um, the sounds, not just the music, I'm talking about like the, the yelling out and, and this feeling of just total chaos when, when he would go out into the city and how sort of um, contentious it was. And I really, I thought that was really well done with the yelling like you'd hear. Yeah, and, even like all this, I think the sound design in the movie is unbelievable. And yeah, it's like, it's, I think the big thing that comes across obviously in the script, it was a big part of the, the story about, about what Todd was trying to do here was, you know, how hard and, and cold the city can be to individuals, right? The city on mass is just this like world of people sometimes striking out violently against each other. But really you've got this like sort of lonely man in the middle who at his heart is actually quite gentle. And, and all he's trying to do is sort of continue to do his thing. And he's really just a, a, an individual that's, that's um, you know, that, that I think it's, a, it's an example of how society treats each other and the effects that it can have, particularly when we either treat each other without empathy and humanity or we just look, you know, we have invisibility, you know, we just like, we just see past them and walk past them and all those sort of big ideas as to how society treats each other. And I think that was a big part of it. And, and what better way to sort of expose that, but when Arthur is in that world, to show everyone around him, you know, as, as, uh, uh, as uncaring effectively, or just like, what's the word? The word's more, you know, uh, uh, you know they uh, that the that the world uh, it's not even uncaring. It's like it's that that they have no that they, you're just invisible. Like on the bus in the beginning, yes, the woman sort of is saying, you know, please don't bother my kid. But everyone else on the bus could care less. You know, nobody's intervening. Nobody's sort of coming to his defense. Nobody's really cares. They're just trying to do their thing. So uh, you know, I think that's part of it. Yeah, there was also the feeling of disdain that people had for him that you started to, and then I don't know if that was how the laughter or something that seems disarming then became this tool of like, or, or, or people looked at him with just this total disdain, like. Yeah, I think it's like disdain and, and um, it's just insignificance, you know, I think, I think we, we can recognize in Arthur and his struggle every day, so many parts of ourselves and, you know, it's the way you look past the homeless person because you'd rather not look at the person than, than confront the, the reality of their situation or, or, or somebody who's, who's suffering from madness or psychosis. Like, we see them all the time in our, in our world. We see them on the streets. We walk past them. Um, it's interesting. Like, I had somebody say the movie reminded them of um, that Woody Allen movie with Kate Blanchett that she won. The, or oh, she yeah, was certainly Blue nominated. Jasmine. The, what was it? Blue Jasmine? Yeah, Blue Jasmine, right? And I thought, oh, it was really interesting because Blue Jasmine's like a origin story of a person speaking crazy to themselves on a bench, right? Like that's ultimately who she ends up at the end of the movie. And it's like Blue Jasmine's just an origin story of like how this woman got to be in that bench. And I thought, oh, yeah, it's actually a pretty similar analogy. This is an origin story of how this man became the person he, he was and like all the things that led to it. And I thought that was kind of a cool analogy. And also, too, there's a class issue because isn't she in San Francisco? And so having grown up there, I know, especially in the 80s, I know you've talked about this in other interviews, but at that time, a lot of mentally ill people were on the streets. And yeah. I would see that. And that's why I really picked up on the voices because I would hear that a lot. As a child walking down the street in San Francisco, you would hear these this yelling. Yeah, and that movie dealt with class in another way, which was like she came from money. But she was now going to a place of like losing it. And what does that feel like, right? Like hey, she actually lived in both worlds and she ends up just being that person that you sort of, you know, walk right past and don't think about. And she's got a whole story, right? And so this is this movie's no different, you know. It's it's a guy that, you know, it's it's uh 
you wonder like in the backstory of the people in the movie, like if that woman on the bus or the people on the bus, if this was like a real life story, would go, oh my God, that guy, the guy who just shot Murray Franklin, that's the same guy on the bus. Like that you would even do that thing where suddenly, you know, you correlate one thing to another and say like, wow, I barely even noticed him, right? It's like that thing that you, that we do all the time with people that strike out on society and, and suddenly they're seen, but, you know, uh, previously unseen, so. Then the Santa I'm, Monica I'm, residents. I would agree 100%. You hold the door for them, they thank you, you do that at Starbucks and you get a look of like, I mean, it's just really interesting. It's, it's just, I think it's one of the powerful parts of this movie that I think has helped it break out. And, and frankly, it's something that I think I'm super proud of is besides taking, making something that is wholly just a piece of entertainment that can make money and you know all the things that a, the business of, of show business has to do, but as a piece of filmmaking and storytelling that it can help just shine a light on some of those issues. I've had people in Q and A's and other people who've said, you know, they suffer from mental illness and it really spoke to them and it spoke very powerfully to them and the fact that they feel invisible and they feel, feel unseen and, and all of these things. And, um, and it's not that they feel that way and feel like they wanna strike out against society the way Joker did. Um, it, you know, it's that they just feel suddenly like they understand, like they feel just a kinship with with the story that we were telling and so it's it's that i think is the most positive aspect of of the success of the movie is that it's touched people you know be, you know in ways that i think uh we would hope for but but not necessarily expected how much time did you have with joaquin phoenix before principal photography yeah as a cameraman you know a cinematographer you you don't necessarily spend that much time. It depends on the movie, of course, but it depends also on the director and how much rehearsing they do. And you may have, if you have a director that does a ton of rehearsing, you may spend more time prior to the movie starting, working with those actors and understanding a little bit of them. And there are certainly filmmakers like Sidney Lumet and other guys that like literally will rehearse the whole movie with all the actors. And Todd's not one of those guys. Joaquin, I think, is also not necessarily one of those big rehearsal guys. I think he's he's a classic gamer in sports metaphors. He just wants, to, when it happens, he wants it to be captured, and he sort of wants it to be when the movie's happening for real. So my interactions with Joaquin were very, very small and nominal uh, leading up to the first day of shooting. I'd see him for makeup hair tests, and certainly when he was like in the office, trying the makeup on for, for a couple times. We would, I'd come in, I'd take some still pictures of him, I'd have conversations with Todd about, but it wasn't like we spent much time together at all. My first real interactions with Joaquin, in a real sense, was basically day one of shooting. Watching him perform like for the first time, first shot, Wow. you know, and, and then over the course of making the movie, we shot the movie in 58 days, I, I, then the relationship really formed and you know, became a relationship by the end where there was a lot more interaction and conversations. And certainly, I think uh, we both understood each other a little bit more. He understood what I was trying to do with the movie. I certainly, of course, had seen what he was doing with the movie. And so there was a lot more interaction by the end. Yeah. And his ability to make this character who, in the end, is, is powerful in a destructive way, but seems so fragile. So, I mean, there's so many times Absolutely. I wanted to put my arms around well, Arthur. I felt so, like, he just was so I fragile. agree. Well, that's the whole beauty of the way he sort of built the arc of the character with him and Todd is, it's, it is, it's like, it's, yeah, I mean, meek is one word, but it's not really that. He's just a, he's just a gentle person. Like, his place in the movie, in the, in the early stages, is one of, of um, you know, accommodating to some extent, right? You know, there's, there's, there's just like, there's a, there's a, a sense of, um, he just a real human sense to him. I mean, he just really created a very human character that has all the frailties and, and all the things. And, and that makes even the power of him wanting to be a comedian, which is such a high profile. I, I mean, to me, comedians, and obviously with Todd, 
having done so many comedies, and I've certainly shot a lot of comedies, comedians are the most fascinating people. And I feel like to stand up and do comedy is the hardest thing in all of the creative arts. I really believe that. I think you are the most vulnerable and naked because jokes are jokes, right? Like you go out to set out to do comedy. It's like what his mom says is, don't you have to be funny to be a comedian? It's like, it's cut and dry, it's black and white. Like you stand out in front in a spotlight and you try to tell jokes. If people aren't laughing, essentially you're not a comedian and it's pretty straightforward and there's not a lot of argument. You go out and make something that's supposed to move people. Generally speaking, you don't know that and, and you're not knowing it instantly. You don't sense it from the audience. There's a lot of internal stuff and I respect so much anybody who tries stand-up comedians, stand-up comedy. So to me, what a cool device to take this person that's so small and like you say, you want to hug him because he's He's obviously dresses up like a clown and he has to perform, so he has that part of him. But that dichotomy of character, the fact that he is this person that like, even when he's stretching his shoes and you see the frailty of his body and how skinny he is, and when, even when, uh, when he gets the gun from Randall, he's even in that moment, he's just like, I'm not supposed to have a gun. Right. Like, it's all very small and all very, um, and I think those elements of, of Arthur's character and what Joaquin did with him and Todd, of course, is to me is such a beautiful thing because you see this massive dichotomy even within the same human being. And I think that's what the movie is exploring, right? It's exploring those two sides of all of us, you know, that's that true. are battling constantly, right? There's like a side that doesn't want to be seen and there's a side that wants to be seen. There's a side that wants peace and harmony and there's a side that wants chaos and madness right and and i think that's really what the movie deals with on a, on a grand level and and which direction do you decide to take to take yourself you know and it, you know i think in all of us we try to be good but sometimes we're fighting our inclinations to be rageful and angry and all these things i don't think there's a person among us who's not suffering from from that that uh that part of ourselves, right? That's what being a human being is. And I think here you're seeing it explored over the course of a two-hour movie in a way that I think is pretty pretty effective. You could even take, and this is off going off on a tangent a little bit, but Andy Kaufman, who had that same thing, and when he needed to be larger than life, he could be, but then he could be Latka, you know? That's right. And that was a good example of somebody who almost seemed mad. Like when he decided to be the other Andy Kaufman, the one that was like angry, and it was often that exact thing, right? Somebody gentle matched with, against anger, right? It's like the, the aggressive Andy Kaufman that would fight the wrestler and get punched by David, you know, like right. you know, on the David Letterman show, all those things. It like that's a complete opposite spectrum of his personality. But when he was in that personality, he was in it so deeply that he seemed almost mad, right? And, and insane. And so. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good a good analogy as well. Since you had very few meetings with Joaquin Phoenix, yeah. correct, before uh, shooting principal photography, how are you building trust with an actor? That's a really good question. I think you build it as you make the movie. Honestly, I think it's, it's you're not necessarily, you know, there's a certain level of trust perhaps based on your previous work and either they like the work or they're not, you know, and I, frankly, I don't even know. I don't know what Joaquin had seen of mine outside of what he'd probably seen of Todd's, he certainly trusted Todd. By proxy, maybe the things that Todd had done successfully, certainly over the last five films that I've done with him, perhaps that gave, gave Joaquin the trust. But I think it's no different than Todd gaining trust with Joaquin. I think it happens every day in small ways, right? And I think you're just constantly looking to each other and, 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 and he's looking for signs and I'm looking for signs of trust, and we're just trying to find, build that trust over time. And you know, uh, that's every movie and every everybody. I mean, some, and that's some, sometimes the hardest part is when you have an actor that comes in for just a day or two, and they've obviously have a lot of experience and are quite you know good at, at what they do. And in all those situations, or an actor that's just there for one day, you're trying to find a place to build trust. It's one of the fun things about working on movies is. Everything is kind of in hyperspeed, you know. 
You work in an office, perhaps you get to know an office worker over the course of six months, a year, and then many, many years. But even in an office situation, day one for that person, they're all looking for signs to build oh, yeah. trust, right? <laughs> I've I worked think, in some offices. Yeah, like, yeah. it's just like they, they, it's part of human nature, right? Sure. We're just like, and I, I've always found like that that part of filmmaking to be a subset that's very interesting to me is the fact that you take these disparate people, you put them together, they all have special skills, they come together on a project that the stakes are quite high. Sometimes they're made for hundreds of millions of dollars. and and you all have to come together and work together quite quickly. Like you don't have months to get to know each other. You know, you often have just days to get in a situation in which everyone kind of knows their role, the boundaries, who's in charge. It's it's a very, I, I've, I've eternally find it fascinating just the way movies work as a as a piece of art and as a piece of commerce. And, and I'm always interested in that. And so you learn some of those things. But I think for Joaquin, you know, it's also, you know, he started watching some stuff played back on on the monitor and he could watch some stuff on dailies. And I think in watching that, I think he started to understand what the movie was beyond his work. Because, you know, as an actor, he's doing his thing. But he also has to trust that the editing is going to work and the cinematography is going to work. And, and everybody is coming together to, to, to like, he might think he's doing this amazing thing. But all that matters is also, are we capturing it? You know? And if he did it and we didn't quite capture it, well, then that's, then we're not in sync. So I think it's like, it's an important you know, aspect of, of filmmaking is that trust thing. And I think uh, sometimes you don't get it. In this, I think, I, one of the things I remember texting Todd very early on, I, I mean, I wanna say it was like day three, and it was just like a, text of saying, oh man, I think our first three days are going really well. And it wasn't even a kiss up email. I know Todd for the ages and we we're far from ever kissing each other up. <laughs> but I was actually genuinely saying how impressed I was, how how well he works with actors, because I've obviously I've also done it myself, in that he's able to gain trust very quickly and make them feel like he, they're in a really safe place and that there's a really good give and take. And I just remember thinking, oh, this, is, this movie is working well so far, earlier than I thought, because a lot of movies take weeks, simply because I could see how much Joaquin already trusted Todd, and I thought that was, that was a good sign for sure. Yeah. What's the most emotion you felt filming Joaquin's performance? That's a really good question. I mean, I felt it so many different times. I felt it... Um, I think when he performs at the comedy club is a pretty powerful one. Just watching him be so exposed on stage, sort of failing and, but just carrying on and just there's something in his eyes in that scene that has always gets me. Um, the scene when he like is trying to get the papers from the clerk, Brian Tyree Henry and, and that little one-on-one scene with the, the sort of in between the clerk's uh, the great that's in front of separating them. There's, there's just, I love that performance of that scene. I find it to be mesmerizing. I'm always sort of leaning forward when I watch that scene with him. Um, I mean, there's probably many, many. I'm just trying to think of the ones that popped to my head first. Um, I think that scene on the bus. Certainly shooting that scene on the bus. We, we shot that scene, I think it was day two or day, day three maybe. Day two actually. So it was the second day of our shooting. It was that scene on the bus with the, with the kid and the little boy. And the, like just see, shooting his side of the action, right? It's all cut up obviously like a scene now. But just shooting him perform that scene that early in the shoot, I went, oh my God, this guy is something else. This guy is the best I've ever seen and what he's doing already with this performance and what he's doing to create Arthur Fleck as a human being and who's suffering, you know, I thought it was beautiful because in that one scene, he's doing everything, right? He's, he starts having just had gotten beaten up by a bunch of kids in an alley. So he's coming into the scene, still living in that space, looking out the window 
And then he's now trying to connect and do his thing, which he's sort of conditioned to do as a human being, but also who he really is, which is to try to make some little boy smile. And then he's sort of reprimanded for it. And then goes into this coughing, is this laughing fit, which I think always embarrasses him because it's on something he can't control and then has to hand out this card that describes it. So in that one scene, it kind of like shows all the facets of him as a human being. And I've I always found that scene to be really, really powerful. And also to the scene in the bathroom uh, where he confronts his. Yes. Yeah. 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 Maybe That's spoiler a very alert, powerful scene. Yeah. And yeah, where he's really, truly, you know, just reaching. It's like he's just trying to find a connection, you know, and just trying to sort of find that part of him that's missing, you know, whether it's his father or just another person to help, you know, be there with him so he's not so lonely in this world, you know. And the scenes with his mother when they would watch the game show or the talk show. Yeah, that's a lovely scene in the beginning. Yeah, or even when he's washing her hair, it's like, it's lovely. It's like these, these two people have each other in the world. And I think that's what makes the revelation of, of her and what she did to him as a youngster, and, you know, and, and allowing his abuse and some of those things, what makes it obviously so powerful when it's revealed. Sure. Will you ever laugh or cry while you're filming? Oh, for sure. I've definitely laughed. I mean, I've laughed out loud. Obviously, Todd and I have made a bunch of movies in which, not many times, but I've certainly like laughed enough that it's like gotten on the soundtrack, and I'm like, ugh. <laughs> you know, we obviously you can't affect this the take, but, um, but I've cried in, in 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 certainly operating the camera and watching a scene before for sure, for sure. I've done that in movies that I've done. I've been a part of. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just incredibly moved when you're watching something happen for real. Sometimes you can separate yourself and go into sort of work mode in which you're you're thinking about the next shot and that you're, you're not as present as you'd like to be. But when you are watching somebody work at a really high level and they really are just performing it in, you know, in that way, it drags you right back into the present in the best way possible. And you're compelled to just have nothing else in your head except to watch that person perform and then it can become amazingly powerful and even if like I'm not sure I I cried and I certainly laughed watching Joaquin because there was a lot of physical humor in the movie that some some of it's not in the movie still but just in the way that he could do you know whatever it was doing like you know falling down or just his physicality and you know you, the scene when he gets fired, it, so it was a little bit of a longer scene than is in the final cut of the movie. And when we shot that scene, there was like there were sections of that that I just was I, I was heartbroken by because he really wanted that job. And yeah. you recognize that losing that job was really just it, it, it was very powerful to him. And and I remember when we shot that scene feeling really moved for sure. Yeah, and I think that one was one of maybe three where, yeah, I definitely yeah, it's, it's like, had the tissue out. Yeah, he's definitely, you know, again, he's a human being in spite mm -hmm. of all the, who he becomes and this sort of like villain that the Joker is supposed to be. At, at, you know, at his heart, he's still just a man. In the filmmaking process for Joker, was there one scene maybe toward the beginning of the principal photography where you said, this is going to be great and it just energized you and it, it really kept you on this like momentum? Yeah. Moment? Honestly, it was like the first shot we did. Wow. The first shot we did shooting the movie was uh, him at the social workers scene. That is like the second scene in the movie. So when he's laughing, that big laughing spell and then she starts asking him about you know the job and and the, and he, he's asking like that whole scene which is like seven or eight pages or so of material actually both social worker scenes and then when he comes back the second time and says you never listened to me all that we shot both those scenes it was like 10 pages of work in one day not even a long day but that first take of him performing i went this is gonna be pretty great like I was like, this movie could be divisive because it's darker than people expected or maybe not as funny as they would expect from Todd. Or I knew that there would be some things in which you go, we, 
we might not get all the you know the batman and the and the dc fans on board but what we're going to make is going to be something that that we're going to be really proud of simply because i could see it from that performance and then honestly i was like i would go home and you know excitedly show dailies to my wife and just because i was so excited to show her what we were doing so i was feeling pretty strong and pretty like pretty high 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 about the movie all the like from the beginning and then it was really motivating because i recognized oh wait okay so we can't let off the gas ever like as opposed to like if you start slowly and you start to get up to speed and you're like by two weeks in you're like oh wait now i understand the movie and we're gonna start and then you start like ramping and every day you're like trying to make it better and better here i was like oh shoot day one was great day two was great day three also a great scene all right now it was like every day has to be this good and so then it was just like a it was motivating to just really keep hyper focused on making something that i thought could be certainly the best thing todd and i had done together um and i wanted it to be the best thing i had ever done i just did it was like a definitely a thing where i went i just want this to be the best work i've ever done and so i just stayed super focused every day to to not let off the gas so i was feeling pretty po- you know pretty positive about the movie right away how much of the film is improvisational i don't know how much would be improvisational there's a lot of improvisation as to like sort of the the way that we don't rehearse and we don't put down marks and we don't really we just start shooting the scene and sort of witnessing it in real time and that way it's very improvisational as far as within the body of the scene not a ton we did some scenes that were just ideas for things you know that were not necessarily in the script when we first started that would just become sort of ideas that we could do in terms of like him in the apartment and things like that but as far as and 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 you know Joaquin was certainly fine to kind of go off the script a little bit in terms of just like for instance when he stood up and is playing with the gun and he's like talking to himself about like oh you're a really good dancer you know that wasn't in the script that just was happening in real time and you know may have been discussions with Todd but for me and my team it was just like this is happening so let's just you know photograph it but generally speaking Todd's not one of those improv guys that just goes all right now try this now try that it's if we're going to change the script he changes it with the actors and and the writer and he kind of works it out a new version of the scene and then we'll just carry on from there and shoot that version as opposed to sort of changing it within the real improvisation is more in the sort of technique and and the fluidity in which me and my camera operator would tell the story as we would shoot the scenes and the fact that we you know, like i said we wouldn't rehearse or put down marks and those kind of things so we would just make the movie a bit improvisationally at times you know which would maybe half the time was it in the script that at times you weren't sure was this in Arthur's mind or was it really happening I think that's just part of the script inherently right and part of the fact that the joker even in the lore of the comic books is an unreliable narrator of his own life so he will tell stories and it's like was that the truthful story uh, you know, I think I'm not a big comic book guy but I know from like reading stuff and talking to people that he'll tell back stories about himself in comic books or graphic novels in which every time he tells a story it's something different i think to create this idea that is he is he ever being truthful is any of it true is none of it true that kind of thing so i think inherent to the script and certainly you're left to sort of question and ask yourself is that real was i mean and obviously we do it even in within the body of the movie with the sophie character and that relationship to allow us to sort of see a manifestation of that idea in in a in a relationship that he fantasizes about and that yet we're seeing it in a way that it looks like it's happening. So I think it's meant to allow you to have an interpretation as the audience to decide what's real and what's not. But it's certainly not something we wanted to key in and tell the audience precisely what was real and what wasn't because I think we want the audience to have their own interpretation. We're in the talk show like rehearsing for it and 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 kind of being his best self and then 
no spoilers, but going there and, and yeah, not and, knowing and, what was real. Yeah, and <coughs> it's one of those things that, you know, we, we again, Taxi Driver is often used as like a, a template for the movie. And I think obviously because it's a disaffected guy who is, is doing a job and he sort of strikes out against society a little bit, has some of those correlations. But, you know, even that final, final scene in Taxi Driver in which he p- picks up Sybil Shepherd in the taxi cab, is up for interpretation, right? And I don't think when I watched it the first time, I questioned that interpretation. But when I watched it, you know, two weeks ago, uh, you recognize how even potentially obvious, even the sort of stylistic aspects of some of the camera work in that scene could lead you to believe that, like, oh, did Travis Bickle die in that shootout in the in the the lair of the prostitute and this whole postscript of like him being a hero and getting the letter from from Jodie Foster's parents and is that all just a dream or is that all just you know a fantasy of like his afterlife or whatever when I watched it when I was you know in film school or you know back in in college I never and I didn't necessarily go to that interpretation but I recognize that people do so I think similarly people can do the same thing here if they choose to what was the most stressful scene in filming Joker? That's a great question, too. And how did you push through it? I don't think there was a thing. You know the scene when he finds the letter that she's written to Thomas Wayne, and then he confronts her, right? He confronts her, and she just runs into the bathroom, and, and his mom, and he's outside the bathroom. It's a very short scene in the movie. When we shot it, it was a bit longer. It started in the bedroom, he kind of wakes her up, and then they go into the bathroom. And right now it's just kind of like truncated in a good way, I think. But that was a bit of a stressful scene because initially it was written that he was even going to wait longer. It was going to actually happen the next morning. He was going to confront her. And so we had planned to do it as the script was and all these things. And I think just an example of the ways in which we would often just zig away from our plan all the time That was one of those examples. And it came very abruptly. It was like, we were going to shoot that the next day. And it was, he finds the letter. And I think Todd was like, let's just go right into it. I was like, okay, okay. So it just became a little bit of a stressful thing, not because of the change of plan, but because I think part of me really liked the fact that he waited. And there was some elements of that that I was still on board with. And so I think it just shook me up a little bit. And it just, I remember it as a stressful shooting day, you know, and, and I'm glad the way it ends up in the movie, which is what it is, but even the result of the way we started in her, in the bedroom. And I just remember it was like a day in which, you know, Todd and I were arguing a bit and I just, it was a memory of a stressful day for sure, but not necessarily because of the scene itself, you know, even though it's a, it's a emotional scene and he's confronting his mom and all this stuff. It was more of just the way that sometimes scenes in a movie or the the practical nature of shooting the movie can become stressful, you know, time constraints or or um, differences of opinion in that kind of way. So that's, I think, a memory of some of a day being stressful. And where was the apartment constructed? Oh, at Steiner Studio in Brooklyn. So the Murray Franklin set and the apartment were at Steiner, and uh, and, the, and and that apartment was. Mark Friedberg, the designer, did an amazing job. That apartment was pretty, like, it was built, you know, a story up. So so it would look, you know, like it was on an upper floor. But it it was all of his apartment, right, which was like the bedroom, the bathroom, and that main living area with the kitchen. But that long hallway is also part of that as well. That was also built on stage. And it's like, I don't even know, 100 feet of hallway. And that actually leads right to Sophie's room. So that whole little quadrant of, like, Sophie's, the the long hallway and the Arthur's apartment was one big stage on set, so it was pretty pretty spectacular. Because I think to get that long hallway, would, that would feel like the tenement that that he lives in, you know, just involved a lot of space. But that hallway obviously plays a lot into the movie, as well as the elevator, which was also there as well. And then downstairs, the elevator is part of the practical location that we shot with in Bro- in the Bronx, like when he's you know. So those tie in together through movie magic. Did you have to do any retakes? 
on another, like in LA or did, did you? No, know? and I remember Todd at one point, we did do some reshooting when we made the movie. So, and that has become, I think, more commonplace because Todd doesn't like reshoots. I think reshoots are super commonplace in big budget movies. Often they'll do two or three big reshoots, you know, in which they'll shoot for weeks. I've been a part of a lot of them. I shot many reshoots on the first Godzilla. I've done reshoots on big movies, you know. Uh, so I recognize what that is as far as modern filmmaking. Todd, in our six movies together, we've shot two additional days and only one reshoot in six movies. Wow, okay. Yeah, and the other additional day was like a coda that we added to the end of Hangover 3. And so it was like one of those things where it was like, oh, we need to shoot one more thing to add as opposed to even a reshoot. But I think with this, and Todd, so you know, even on War Dogs and other movies, I think Todd's become more... Uh, more to the to the mindset of like rather than bring people back which is so hard to get them back in the frame of mind and all that stuff if I feel like there's something I want to try differently I'll reshoot it while we're shooting so like on Word Dogs we shot one scene two times in which we shot it he looked at it and he went I, I think there's something we can do better so we'd reshoot it so we did that a couple times on on Joker also recognizing and I remember Todd said this is like the the physical transformation that Joaquin did losing all that weight i don't know if he can do this again so the idea that you would cut the movie nine months later ask joaquin to retransform his body into that was just untenable so i think todd to his credit really recognized that like if there's anything we feel like even we might want to reshoot we have to do it now we have to do it within the body of like the days we have so i think in the last couple of weeks of shooting we we allowed for like a little bit of reshooting that we would do not a lot but just a little bit as well as like even the idea that like if you had an idea that would come up after you edited the movie like oh i wish we had more scenes of him just by himself exploring insomnia at night which you might come up with once you cut it then we started going well if we're going to do that let's do that now so i think that's like the scene where he he crawls into the refrigerator was an example of that where it was like it wasn't in the script, but it was like through the exploration of either now seeing cuts or just thinking about the movie like Todd is as an editor as well. I think he recognized now is our time to do it. We can't wait until you know after the movie's cut. When was the first time you saw the film in its entirety with a large audience, and what was your reaction to their reaction? Yeah, well, I saw it early, early on in a cut, and I gave Todd some notes, and. Uh, and then I don't think I saw it for like another two months while Todd took those notes and all the rest of the notes from all the times and just really fine tuned the movie. And it was a screening for Warner Brothers for like their worldwide distribution. I thought it was just a screening he was going to have for a couple people. Todd's like, you want to see the movie? It's basically in its cut where I think it's near, nearly final cut, if not close. Uh, and I was like, yeah, sure. And then when I went, I went, oh, I didn't realize it was like going to be 400 people here. <laughs> And like not a test audience, but like actually the Warner Brothers distribution arm of like worldwide. And uh, I was blown away. I literally, I, I, when the movie ended, I went, it's a freaking masterpiece. Like, and that wasn't just me, like, because I was a part of it. In fact, I'm way harder on the movies I'm a part of and can rarely separate myself in a real objective way to like watch it and get lost in it. But I remember when he does the stuff at the end and he's on top of the police car and it just felt so powerful and so operatic that I just remember thinking, God, this is even better than I thought it would be. And I thought it would be pretty good. And I think helping you know, the audience there and just really sensing the size and the scope of the movie on that screen at Warner Brothers that we watched on is a really big screen. So seeing the power of that, having just witnessed it now on editing monitors that were quite small, um, yeah, I was I was actually quite blown away. And then I thought, oh, geez, this thing could really be a hit. Yeah. Were there reactions or not? not uh, Amazingly, here's the thing. The funny part about that was I was like, because I turned to my wife who was there and I said, like halfway through or something, I'm like, is this working for you? Because unlike a comedy where people are laughing, you really know. Like Hangover, I remember the first time I saw it with an audience, you were like, oh, boy this thing is actually could be a really big hit because it was like raucous and you could feel it. In here, I, anyway, I turned to her and I said, is this working for you? She goes, it's amazing. I 
like loving. I go, all right, good, because I'm feeling the same way. You could sense the audience, you could feel their engagement, you know, you know, you know when audiences are fidgeting. There's a lot of ta- you know, like things, signs that you can tell with an audience to see if it's working, particularly on a movie that you're not te- you're not looking for laughs, but you're looking for engagement. Sometimes that's hard to see. But when the movie ended, I was expecting, because also it was like Warner Brothers and their distribution arm, for there to be just like spontaneous clapping. Like I was even expecting like a standing ovation. <laughs> and like there was none of that. And I went, that was so weird. And Todd goes, no, no, trust me. I've, I've watched this with just smaller audiences too. They never, they're usually just sit stunned. <laughs> and I went, right, right, right. Because then I remember it took like a day in which I could finally digest it. And then starting talking to people, I recognized that they, the, the common experience of the movie is that not one of like clapping, but one of like, like digesting what they've just seen and being a little bit just frozen. And then a day later going, oh my God, that movie was this, or this movie really worked for me. And so we had like a whole reception afterwards with like distribution people and from those people, Throughout the throughout that afterwards, uh, people would go, "Oh my God, this movie is amazing!" So I went, "Oh good, it was working for everyone," but it didn't have that natural thing that happens sometimes at the end of a movie where there's like a sense of like applause, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So it was an interesting experience in that regard. But clearly, it worked because you know they were really high on it and all that stuff. So yeah, great. Yeah, you're right. It, it does take a while. I mean, I, I was still thinking about it, I think, two nights later. Yeah, and I've so, gotten yeah. letters from mm-hmm. friends and emails and stuff. They're, they're, they say that. They go, yeah, I just needed a day or two, but now I recognize like it. And then, and this is, you don't get to a billion dollars without people going more than once, generally speaking. There have been a lot of people I know, you know, and people I don't think generally go to see movies more than once who have gone more than once to then have a, to like now know what the experience was. Because I think, it was it was a different i think it was different than anyone expected certainly the trailer gave clues as to the tone of the movie but i think i think one of the surprises was what the movie wasn't for the fans and what's nice is that that was cool they were cool with that you know sometimes i mean i see even now with just this new star wars movie fans are just they have such a relationship with these movies and and you know, and so the people that were mad at Ryan Johnson are happy of what they made changes in the new version. But the people that love the Ryan Johnson version are mad about what J.J. Abrams did. Like you can't please everyone. So, you, but you recognize that like they have a relationship with these characters in these movies. So you have to be aware that they're part of the experience. And so I think even if you want to stand outside of that you still have to have some interest into what their experience is with the movie. And I think, I think what's interesting is that the, the, I think a lot of the fans in, the, in that universe were happy that it was so different and different and unexpected, darker, or like, you know, they weren't as upset over the things that we thought they might be. There's not enough action. It's not a comic book movie. It doesn't have this, it doesn't have that. All the things that may be in the back of your head, you're going, Will the movie feel too small? Will the movie not, you know, service this sort of crowd that is a, has an expectation of what a Joker movie would be? Were all the things that I think people really embraced, and and I think it's great for the movie industry at large that a movie that you know isn't all those things can still make a billion dollars. Sure. On a lighter note, I think there's like an old Saturday Night Live skit with William Shatner. Or he like addresses yes. a crowd of Trekkies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he just finally breaks down and exactly. says, "People, it was a TV show, you know." But that it, it encompasses this. This it, it meant so much. That's right. That's to right. People. We we have relationships with movies are so powerful and they're so good at, at moving you emotionally and and when they're done well, they really you know you have a connection with them and so and then they become even more powerful as time goes by and and you know and so. Listen, I, I think you you have to make movies aware of your audience, but not for your audience, right? But I think you have to also be aware of that they that they exist and that they're 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 part of the experience, you know. But you hope that you don't necessarily cater everything to them because as a filmmaker, your job is to tell this story and uh, 
and hope that if you tell it with you know a very specific point of view, that it will connect with the audiences at large. Were you aware that so many people that aren't necessarily into the comic book genre would love the film? I was my hope because I came at it from a person who uh, is not a huge comic book fan. So my hope is like, well, my parents would see it. Like they wouldn't necessarily go see, you know, Ant Man, but you know, because they would think of it as a comic book movie. But hopefully, they would go see this and enjoy it because they would. It wouldn't uh, simply exist under that heading, you know, and would exist on its own. So that was the hope, and obviously. You know, we can see that, that, like what it is. I thought as we were making it, for sure. I think as we were making it, I was, I was for sure going, that audience that doesn't like comic book movies will like this. But now we got to make sure we're not, you know, that the audience that loves them won't feel like, what the hell is this? But, but I, I sort of knew that what we were making would service both because I thought, well, first we're making a good movie, but I think in a weird way, um, we're making a movie that's very much like a comic book movie in the truest sense, in the way that like kids when they're 10 years old would have this like very personal experience with the actual comic book, right? Where it's just images on a piece of paper with writing that you have to then bring your own imagination into the sort of deep emotion of it and just like a novel would. And I thought like, oh, you know, but it's a picture novel, right? So. Literally, it's like if we can create these engaging images and we and that in a way we're, we're going to create something that may be a very much a comic book movie or certainly a movie that feels like a graphic novel. So, you know. And, and giving credit to your, I think it was sociology teacher you mentioned that he said that yeah. movies are a product of our decade or you know, the, you know, the, I'm, I'm butchering what he said. But No, I, <laughs> when it, I wasn't a film major in college. I was an economics major, but I, I got into film late and then started taking some classes. And because I was an economics major, I was always interested in sort of cause and effect of things. So he was a sociology and a film professor. He did both. And it was, uh, it was a basically the, the construct of the class was every movie can be seen as a product of the time in which it was made. Right? And like in that class, we literally looked at the way Three Amigos represented like Iran Contra and like the <laughs> and it was like and so I'm always fascinated literally to this day I've never forgotten like what Richard Slotkin who was the name of the professor had said because now I always look at the like even a year in movies right and I look at them and I say what are the trends here right and like what are the trends that that we see in what movies are being made you know I remember I can't remember if it was like the year of The Revenant was like also the year of that All Is Lost movie with Robert Redford. And there was like another movie. And they were all movies about like people, lonely people, like alone trying to survive under great odds. Like, and it was like, well, what is that saying about our society right now? Or certainly like, what does it say that over the last 11 years, right? Like Iron Man 1 came out in 2008, let's say, right? Right, and that kind of like restarted the whole Marvel franchise, right? And and this is just a theory, but like under the same principle that that this professor said, is the GFC happened, right? We now have like watched an entire nation of like a world of bankers and like irresponsible practices dismantle the economy. And nobody got taken to task. There was no justice at large. There was no justice. Nobody went to prison, right? Fines, all this stuff. But nobody literally got pulled off in handcuffs outside of maybe one guy. And, and I go, so we live in a world that has no justice. Well, what better place to show, to like have superhero movies become the most you know, popular genre of movie for the last 10 years? Because we live in a world in which I think often we don't see justice. So what? So you, where, where do you find justice? You find justice in superhero movies, but you're not getting justice from politicians. You're not getting justice from from you know judges and lawyers. You're getting justice from like a literal superhero. They're the only ones who can give us justice, which isn't even realistic because they don't exist. So we've created this thing in which we now want to go see justice in movies because we're not getting it in real life. So 
and there are microcosms of that every year in movie making. And so what is what are movies trying to tell us about society and how are they reflecting society? And I've always believed every movie is a reflection of the director's personal point of view and they're a reflection of the society at large because I think we all make movies in the context of when they're made, you know? And so, so I'm always fascinated by that for sure. What are the best fights creative collaborators should have? Also a really good question. They should always be fighting about the movie, right? Never fight about the bullshit, right? Don't fight about win lunches and don't fight about like, those are all important things, but they're not fights that should be really happening. You know, it's like, don't fight, like, like, you know, don't fight about bullshit. Just fight about the creative things in the movie, right? Fight about, challenge each other to, to not take the easy way, right? There are a lot of just the nature of filmmaking sometimes is just, the path of least resistance, the path, path with less friction. People just often want to check a box off so they can complete it and move on to the next task. And I think, I think it's always important to, to just be another voice in the room that can challenge when, when maybe that, that, that we're taking the route of least, of, of least resistance or we're, ta we're taking the easy way out instead of like continuing to push ourselves to, to make the most uncompromised version of the movie. There are compromises in everything. So it's not to say every single thing is, is reason to go to battle. But I think you pick and choose moments to just make sure that like, you know, that, that me and the director and the actors and all the, all the departments are continuing to just try to um, push ourselves to make the best thing possible. So as long as it's about the movie, I think the fights are admirable. And as long as you recognize that it's a benevolent monarchy, you know, or a benevolent dictatorship, I should say, really, is that one person needs to, it's an essential part of the process, to be the final arbiter, and that's the director. And that's, that's super necessary. That, that director needs to, at some point, draw the line and say, this is the way we're going, and, and the discussion's over, and you move on. So as long as you don't keep fighting past that, Never hold grudges, have a short memory, right? If you don't get your way, move on and, 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 and go, go, go into the next situation as if nothing happened, I think is, is always really, really productive. Yeah, I think there's like this safety and it comes back to trust where you know you can get mad at someone and then the next day you can see them and you can try to reset. That's right, you hope that that's exactly right. right. Yeah, you hope that you don't get to a point where you cross the line or something has residual effect. That's why as long as it doesn't linger or last, then you're, you're in a good place. Yeah, for sure. Just like any relationship, by the way. It's so different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a marriage of sorts, you know? Yeah, and, and also too. It's a family. It's the like same way, right? And you want to be able to fight with your family in ways that you ne might necessarily can't fight with your coworkers or your, or your, your um, your friends even in the way that you know that the family is always still going to be there, right? So, and, and, and unfortunately, sometimes that means you fight with your family worse than you fight with your friends because you don't create those boundaries. But I think it's very similar, you know? It's, uh, you become super, super close with the people you work with and high stress environments and all these other things. So, um, you know, it has all the feels, as they say, you know, in making a movie. Filmmaking is not math, it's jazz. Yeah, yeah, that's a Todd thing. Oh, okay. Todd says that, I just love saying it. I remember him saying that like ages ago, like I don't know, three movies ago, but I just love it. It's like it's such a great expression because and we were talking about somebody we had both worked with who was super scientific about the way he would edit a movie and the way he would treat even jokes. And it was like, if a joke worked, it would get made in the movie. But almost like it was just a, it was it was where you were trying to turn filmmaking into math that I think Todd was like, yeah, it's like you can't one plus one doesn't equal two in filmmaking. It's just something different. You want one plus one, frankly, to e equal three. Right? You want it to be greater than the sum of its parts. And there's an intangible in there that is the, the missing one. Right. And that intangible is like the thing that is the jazz. It's the. It's the being super present when you're making a movie 
and watching everybody else move and just, which is what jazz is, right? Like when they start, when jazz starts, it doesn't know where it's going, doesn't know where it ends. And everybody has to really be in sync and watch each other and find their own place within the song, right? So you, you just, like, it's amazing when you watch them. They just, one guy takes over and suddenly has like a little solo on the drums and then it switches back into like all four pieces working together and then suddenly now the trumpet has a solo and all that ways in which everybody has a place to shine but you're still working as a group and 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 the fact that you don't necessarily know where it's going I think is just a cool way to think about filmmaking is that you have this structure which is your screenplay and your plan but that you really should just just sometimes just feel it out and uh and, and that way it'll allow you to discover a new piece of music that you didn't write before then, right? It's like, then it becomes something brand new. And that's the part of it that I really love that expression. How did that happen on Joker? Well, that was sort of that thing of, of, um, of not rehearsing and not, you know, and just, just, you know, we started getting to the place of just rolling the minute Joaquin would walk into the room kind of oh, thing. Wow. And so sometimes you just would roll into it and you know, you knew the structure, he was gonna be writing his journal or he was gonna do this because you still have to tell a story linearly enough that you know you're tracking all the things you wanna track. So otherwise the movie can feel too improvisational, right? Like, and then it starts to feel a bit, you know, meandering and lost and some of those movies can work, but I also like, you know, when a movie has a certain that you are following enough of a structure that you're telling a very specific story. Now, within the body of that specific structure, you can be improvisational and have some of that jazz, right? Which is just to allow the actor enough freedom to be able to do what they want to do and not bound it into something where, you know, and, and that's where the other actors that would have to act against Joaquin would also have to stay in that rhythm that you know and and you'd watch some actors would do it beautifully i thought that brian tyree henry did it immaculately well because it's just an example of the rhythm and the way in which joaquin would drive a scene was always different and just his pacing and even if the words were similar it was just the way in which he would work that um that you know brian had to stay in sync with that and sometimes we would intentionally like that scene we intentionally cross shot which is not something most dps would go to normally because it's somewhat compromising right where you actually shoot both people at the same time right normally you shoot one at a time then the other person cut them against each other simply because you can just control the lighting and the and they can compromise each other if you do this but we shot that scene purposely at the same time cross shooting it with two cameras because knowing that if Joaquin was gonna do something that was a little off base, we wouldn't necessarily wanna to have to replicate it on the other side. So we wanna have the real time you know, reaction of, we try to do that as much as possible. Um, and so, you know, and a lot of, them, a lot of the movie is you know, one or two people in scenes, so sometimes that was a little bit easier to do, but if we could shoot the, the two people, we, we did it simply so that, you know, we didn't have to feel like suddenly Joaquin had to match something when he did it on the other person's coverage. So that was a big part of, of like allowing that improvisation to happen uh, so we could do very few takes, but Joaquin had the freedom to know that, that it was being captured in whatever he did. And with that freedom, would Joaquin ask questions about the character or was it just, it was like he had already he, he knew Arthur so well. Oh, I mean, there are so many smoke breaks between Todd and Joaquin <laughs> that there are, there are a lot of questions. That's answers. its own movie right there. You should yeah. have done B-roll on that Oh, shit. I know. I just like, the, just the, 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 the cigarette break. The, um, yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of being a director and, and certainly is they have conversations that are like, wonderful and myriad of stuff that and I'm frankly not necessarily always privy to. So I think they talked for hours. Like they talked after hours. There were a lot of questions and a lot of conversations about who the character was. That's all in there. It's not like Joaquin had a very keen sense and then that was it and we shot 
for 58 days. Oh. The, we were adjusting it all the time. It's, I think one of the things that Todd does really well is, is also just that he's, he's super fluid as far as recognizing the movie is being made every day and you're discovering what the movie is every day. You have a plan, but you're really making the movie day by day and, and it's adjusting day by day. So, you know, you're making adjustments to the character and you're discovering new things about the character and, and all of these things. And so that's happening all the time. And Todd's really good about allowing that to happen because I think it's a really good trait in a director is to not be so single-minded and focused on your plan that you lose sight of potentially a better plan. When was Todd excited about the filmmaking process for Joker? Right, so obviously I was on board like from the moment one in terms of like really feeling like we were moving in, in the right direction and that we were making something really great. I think for sure Todd knew that we were on the right track, but I think the process of making Joker is tough on Todd, you know, and I think where he experiences perhaps the joy and the, um, the, f the thing that I was experiencing as we were making it, I think Todd experiences when he's editing it, right? And I think that's a pretty common thing with directors. There's so many things you're thinking of every step of the way when you're directing that I think the process of directing for some people can be less joyful than others. You know, um, Todd Solans, you know, the guy who did like happiness and stuff. I remember reading he like literally hates making movies more than anything. He loves movies and making them at large, but the making, like the day by day shooting is, and I may be quoting wrong, but at least I remember hearing that and I, I recognize why. Todd, it probably falls somewhere in the middle. I don't think he hates it, but I think with Joker, um, he recognizes that every day there were a lot of directions you could go. And, and I think when you have to stick with one, you know, you're, you're, it's fraught with a certain level of, uh, you know, just, just you, you're so single-mindedly focused that I think you, you know, Todd, I think, feels that joy when he starts cutting. Whenever I see Todd in the editing room, I think he, he just feels like he's now recognizing the fruits of the labor. As opposed to, I'm sort of seeing some of that in real time when we're making it. Todd, I see that in the editing room. So I think Todd... Todd, I think, was starting to realize, oh, good, we made something quite good once he started putting it together and recognizing like all the way the pieces were coming together. So, And I can only assume, I'm, I'm not Todd, but I, I can only assume that also, too, the, the little sort of commentary of the fans and the non-fans and what are the critics going to think and then the, 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 there's this, you know, and so all of that gets heightened, especially... Yeah, and that, caliber. and that, yeah, for Todd, that though, that kind of thing, I feel like he, at the very least, if it was in there, it's only internal to him, and I can't speak to it. We never really talked about it, outside of the fact that we recognized that there were a lot of eyes on us. In the same way as like, there's so much paparazzi, and they're going to be worried about like, well, what is the Joker makeup look like? So it was like the first time in our career together where I remember. Like there had to be a conscious effort to like get photos out of like what Joker's makeup was going to look like early enough so that it got it didn't get out in paparazzi and so you could actually like give it to the fans so they could digest it, have their comments, move on. How much of that affected Todd? I can't speak to. For me, I could see positive comments right away, so it was good. It was like okay, fair enough. And I, we don't do a deep dive to try to like analyze it. Uh, as far as like, and again, I don't think Todd would make an adjustment anyway. I think he would just say, this is what it is. If they like it, they like it. If not, then, you know, they'll deal with it and hopefully the movie will still convince them. So I don't know if that was a big part of it. I think it's just like trying to fill out, figure out the character and make sure the direction it's going and all those things that are just the tr tricky part about being a director. Whereas once he's in the editing room, it's really just him and Jeff Groff, the editor, allowed to kind of now in a more meditative way, take that material and start really crafting the movie um, in a way that I think allows Todd to sort of see it um, and see how it's working, you know, as opposed to me, yeah, just really, you know, I don't know if, I, I just, it's, it's one of those things also, just I don't know, because 
I'm not in Todd's head, but you know, I would go home and rewatch dailies, which I don't necessarily always do on movies. When, and I don't know if he would do the same, you know. I would watch them, obviously, because I was watching them to see about adjustments, but also, you know, looking for things that we were doing right so we could continue on that path, so, yeah. Like the use of light and color. And it was yeah, and just like also you try to get a little objective. When you're in making the movie, there's a lot of stressors of the day, time, management, you know, all the things you're trying to do within a certain amount of time. And I think you rewatch dailies just to have some objectivity to see, is this still the right direction? Is like that lens choice the right direction? How does that translate when you now can watch it with a little bit of distance, you know? Is Joker your best work? Yeah, Joker is, is the best thing I've done to date, I think. I mean, every movie I do, I have certain pride about it and you know some regrets I, I i would go through a thing where i would try to have the fewest number of scenes that i thought ah, i really didn't do the best job i didn't like the choices i made the lighting's not as good as i should i made a mistake those kind of things sometimes i would just look to see if i could get those number of scenes down to you know five to four to three to one um in this i just think every day i really sort of pushed myself personally to try to do a combination of make something that really serviced the emotional integrity of the story but also tried in whatever way i could to be a bit more artful than i perhaps had, had chances to be in other movies and so to really make something that i felt like could service the movie um, but also show a little bit more of an artistic side of myself and so in that regard i'm super proud of the movie and the way it turned out because it does feel like like a high water mark for my own personal work and and something where I now can to you know every movie I ever do I literally try to say this has to be the best thing I've ever done every movie um, and and so I always set out for that to be the goal and, um, and certainly it was the you know one of the last movies I've done so so I, I feel like it, it to some extent I accomplished that for myself. And how does that feel? Because I think you had said that there was one year where you got one job and you made like X amount of dollars, and I'm sure that was a very tough year. And now to have this be this monumental, not just the work, but the box office yeah. results. and Yeah, and that was like 20 years ago is when I made this movie, Kissing Jessica Stein. And I think it was just, there are all kinds of um, watershed moments that you have when you look back at a career. And... And sometimes you obviously, it's easier to look back at them as opposed to when they're happening. That year was monumental simply because I was doing camera assisting and I was sort of going back and forth between shooting and, and assisting. And I made a real effort that year to stop doing any assisting and really cut that tie off and just hang in the wind with whatever I could get my hands on. And it was just, it was tough going because it's early in your career and you, you interview for a lot of stuff, but you don't necessarily get it. And Kissing Jessica Stein was near the end of the year. And I remember just thinking, wow, that was a tough year. It was like a year of struggle. And yet that movie then served to be, at the time, was like the first movie of mine that sort of went to festivals and made some money and gave me a profile that allowed me to get Garden State. And Garden State then allowed me to get, you know, Dukes of Hazard, which allowed me to get studio movies like Dan in Real Life or... Um, you know, or hangover and those kind of things. So each of those things ends up serving as like a stepping stone to the next thing. So, you know, I've had successes with movies where like the hangover franchise obviously gave a profile to me and and Todd and allowed us to make more movies and gave me some other opportunities. But I think between Godzilla this year and Joker, both being released in the, in the same year and being not necessarily comedies or in that genre, it's felt like a, a really positive year because I've just been able to sort of show a little different gear of myself photographically and, and, and just show muscles that I think other people hadn't necessarily had an opportunity to see, things that I've always wanted to experience, which hopefully will lead to future uh, projects that, that will continue to show that side of myself and allow me to do stuff that's challenging, but also a little bit artistic as well. 
I think I remember sitting in a theater before some art house film and Joker trailer came on and it's not a film if I just heard it on its own but when I saw the trailer and saw with the with the light and the color and the music and everything I was like okay this is one I definitely want to see and so it's interesting how that draws in non-comic book fans right. is that artistic Yeah is that is that you know in a weird way we made this 70s art house movie. I mean, it's a really challenging movie in the landscape of the way studios make and release movies these days, you know, in spite of the fact that it obviously, and it's helped by the fact that it has the IP of Joker in DC, but on its face value, it's like it's not traditionally a movie that you would think would be as successful as it would be. And I think that's obviously very satisfying because we tried to make something uncompromised and something that we felt. Uh, could be challenging and and wholly original in our own way, but that can also you know blow up in your face and you make something that you know doesn't doesn't do well and then and then you know there's a whole another conversation about why it didn't do well. But but obviously we're really excited about the fact that people have embraced it. What's the biggest lesson from Joker that has not only changed you but you can carry forward to if you were to ask to speak at a film school. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. So what's the the biggest lesson I I can I I took from Joker or making Joker that I would pass on to filmmakers? I think that there's two things. I think one to to really push yourself and take chances and to just not take the conservative route. So I think one I, I kept the movie very simple in a lot of ways, but uh, every day and every every time we set to 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 do a scene, I just made a conscious effort to like not hold back and to you know it's it's easy you take some risks when you're young, and then you get opportunities in which the movies get bigger and sometimes you're under time constraints in which you have to go back to like a a thing you've done before in a way that can be somewhat repetitive but also conservative. And I think if you can find opportunities to to just be as risky as you can be and to take chances, I think the the payoff will be great. And I think that's something I I take away for sure. And also when you you know, when you think about what yeah, it, it also will, the the movie also was an experience for me where I had, well, I'd have a lot of conversations between me, Todd, and Joaquin about which direction we should go. Sometimes it was like photographically, sometimes it was with the character, sometimes it was with the story. And because I've worked with Todd six times, I was involved in some of those more intimately than perhaps some cinematographers would be. And I think what I came across was, was sometimes I was right in my opinion, and sometimes I was wrong. Same thing with Todd and Joaquin, they were sometimes right. And so I think between the three of us, I recognize that all those conversations, and sometimes they were arguments, and sometimes they were heated. I recognize that like you're going to be right sometimes, and you're not going to be right sometimes. And so, it's really important to have a point of view and and fight for that point of view, but also recognize that that you may not be right, and that the the and that that that's always an and and so just don't be so arrogant or or self. Um, just like don't 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 feel that that if you're shot down in your opinion or whatever direction you think that suddenly it's not the right thing for the movie because it may well be and 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 you just can't see it yet so i think it was like just a little bit of, a, of an experience to recognize that um you know that there are a lot of different choices you can make in a movie and and the collaboration, I think, is the most important thing, and that each opinion has its own has a, has has really valid valid sort of pros and cons. You know, what's been the most rewarding thing to happen to you from making Joker? I mean, I think I went to Camera Image for the first time, which is this film festival in Poland that celebrates cinematography, and I'd known about it for years within the cinematography community. It's like the mecca where you go and it's filled with just all the cinematographers from across the world that will bring their films of the year. It shows just about all the, the great films of the year over the course of the, the sort of the week-long festival. 
And uh, I was lucky enough to be in competition in the film, in, the, in this festival with like uh, 13 other films um, that were vying for like these frogs, like, you know, the Golden Frog, which is like the best film of the year from a cinematography standpoint. So experiencing that festival, which was such a joyous experience of being with other cinematographers and filmmakers and film students and camera people from across the world and just celebrating film and also celebrating more specifically cinematography. That was one of my finest experiences I've had in many, many years, which was amazing. And, and being able to do some seminars and be on a jury and talk to so many young filmmakers who, who just are excited about making movies was awesome. And that the fact that Joker was in competition allowed me to go, but also, um, you know, and then, and then, and, and so that experience was wonderful. And then Joker ended up winning the golden frog. So, so that was icing on the cake. So, um, that was amazing. That wouldn't have happened without Joker for sure. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I, yeah, that, that would be it. So just feeling like I'm in my element here. I'm amongst just like, I mean, I always wanted to go to Camry Maj. So it was more a function of, I would have probably gone, you know, anyway without the film but obviously having the film there and being able to show it to all my peers and and have it play there and experience that that was that was certainly wonderful and came because of joker so that was pretty great yeah and i wasn't because i was working and shooting a movie i wasn't able to go to venice which i would have loved to have gone i remember going to venice as just a tourist and staying in the hotel where they have the venice film festival and being like god this feels like old hollywood like how great would it be to have a film at the Venice Film Festival? And I remember after that vacation, which was before we made Joker, it was right before we made Joker, that vacation where I went to Italy with my son, I remember saying to Todd, man, how cool would it be if Joker could play at the Venice Film Festival? And then it went and played at the Venice Festival and won the Golden Lion, which was bonkers. So for Todd, it was like, not only did it get to play there, he got the same experience of like winning the top prize there um, and so that must have been amazing for him. So, so, you know, not having that experience, the camera image was like my version of that. Yeah.